Mel, can you turn the TVs on again? They went black. Sorry. She's got this. I'm guessing that 30 second countdown is probably done by now, but good morning, all. Welcome to Cross Point. Hi, Kirsten. I was just talking about you. I miss you. Anyway, it's great to see all of your faces here. It's a great day to be alive. It's a great day to be here. And how about if we stand and we'll send up some hallelujahs? Amen.
you guys are each here. I'm going to go behind this. You know what? <laughs> I'm like, you see, like, we decided for a service. I'm like a little kid with this stand because Greg is so awesomely tall. He had to make a thing under here. <laughs> but when I came up to do announcements, I'm like, oh, my goodness. I just, <laughs> Sorry, it's the little things that get my brain going off track. Imagine that. Anyways, we are so glad you're each here. If you are new, please, please, please go back through those doors. Justine is walking. There, you'll, you won't. Maybe she'll see me. Nope, she's talking. <laughs> there, yes, go find her. We want each one of you guys to feel and know how welcomed and wanted you are in the Cross Point family. But so many times we get in and out so fast, we cannot connect with you guys. Please grab us. Justine is right there. We just love to get you connected. We want everybody to be part of this family. So just remember that next week, just in case after service, if someone's not there. But next week is Mission Sunday. So many of you guys have signed up for hot dish, desserts, kitchen cleanup, kitchen setup. We would love for everybody just to participate and be there. It's another way that we can sit and fellowship and just be together. What I found over the last couple times is um, these potlucks. <laughs> I used to hate them. But it's like it was really fun being able to talk to and connect with new people. So don't be intimidated. The line gets long, but it goes fast. And then just sit with somebody new. All right. Okay, you guys got it. First service, just so you know, was amazing at this. So you guys judge and see if there is good. It's crowd participation. Knock, knock. Who's there? Jin. Jin who? Jin who? Did you get it? Jin who? Restaurant? No, first service is like, okay, Zeke, our fourth child, made up that joke because he loves Jin who? Jin who? Okay, I'm telling you that joke because if you don't like my jokes, that's okay. Sign up and come and buy your tickets for September 8th. There is a comedian coming, and he won't tell you knock-knock jokes. <laughs> okay? So go and look to the information. Look on their website, the bulletin, and I promise, well, maybe I'll tell them. You should try to say that joke and see if they'll laugh at you because they didn't at me. <laughs> okay, you're like John the Baptist. You're coming and making the way straight for the comedian, right? Yeah. yeah just, they they, they yes. will, after listening to me, wow. he will feel more appreciated. So anyways, that's a Only about two people in the first service clapped to you. Yeah, but they all participated, but they were like, this is really... But it's a best joke. Zeke, it's the best joke ever. He's not in here right now. We see him. used to say his joke is awesome. All right. So anyways, <laughs> Pastor Michael, our awesome pastor, and wife are gone um, on vacation. So we will miss them, but we have Greg today. Special treat for you guys. So I'm going to ask the ushers to come up. And we are going to collect our offering and pray. I have a couple youth that will help. If, okay, there you go. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much. I thank you that we can be together and just laugh and praise you. And just, you're just an awesome, awesome God. I thank you for the generosity of this church that people keep giving every week to keep the doors open and just reach out to the community. Let's pray for the worship, um, the rest of worship. I pray for Greg as he preaches. And just um, make today an awesome day. In Jesus' name, amen. Feel free to stand up as the basket passes you to join us in worship.
mighty God. It's just amazing. You know, when you when you look out at walk out at night and look at all the stars and the planets, you know, and how God just spoke that into existence. And what we can see is nothing but a like a speck on this entire ball. That's that's our entire little corner of the universe. It's just amazing that God can just speak that into existence. And he loves us. He 
He loves us so much. He gave us even just the beauty on our tiny little planet Earth to enjoy. He loves us so much. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. We just ask your blessing on, on Greg as he brings a message, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit just flow in this place. Lord, thank you that you are a great God. There's no other God but you, Lord. We just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to have the kids come up here. I'm going to pray for you. And Greg can come on up too. Is there no kids? <laughs> what am I going to do all service? <laughs> this is the first time at all. Oh, there are some people, I guess, going back there. Yes. You guys get, like, such extra attention. That's all right. Some people snuck out the back. Okay. We're going to pray for you guys and Greg. Dearly fathers, thank you so much for the children and the kids and the adults that are here. Let's pray that we'll, they will grow closer to you every day and know how much you love them. And just, Holy Spirit, lead Greg as, with passion and energy and the words you want him to say. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's go. Is sounding good, John? Good. Uh, thank you. Thank you, church. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Pastor Michael, for this invitation. For those of you who don't know me, again, my name is Greg Meyer. My uh, wife, Laura, and I, we've been attending church here 10, 11 years or so. Uh, we now have our daughter, Lily, and son, Caleb, running around here most of the time, too. Um, you should know I'm not a pastor. I'm not seminary trained. I'm just simply a, a guy who loves Jesus. I asked this question in the first service, and I got almost 100% participation. Who in here is simply a grown-up man or woman who loves Jesus? Pretty much everybody. So Pastor Michael saw on first service on YouTube, and I think maybe the second service, you are now all, just like I was, on the backup preacher list. Congratulations. <laughs> it is a privilege, so I hope I'm invited back. But I would love to hear each and every one of you, too. I'm going to start with uh, this story. There was a man who had a pet snake. One day he decided to feed it something special, so he went and bought a mouse. He opened the top of the glass cage and dropped the unsuspecting mouse inside where the snake was sleeping on a bed of wood chips. Now the mouse knew instinctively he had a serious problem. He used his little mouse intellect and decided to use his paws very silently to bury the snake in the wood chips. So how does anyone think uh, the mouse did in this story? Anybody think he survived? Nobody thought so in the first service either. I'm going to leave you hanging and tell you in, a, in just a bit. Uh, let's pray after that story. Uh, Jesus, dear Lord, dear God, we just sang that amazing song, How Great Are You. Uh, we sang that song before it. I'm thankful for your scars. We're going to hear this incredible, incredible moment, this incredible thing Jesus did for us on a mountain. Um, Jesus, you died for us, but before that, you gave us the absolute incredible gift of what it's like to be blessed by you, God, and to enter the kingdom of heaven here on earth. You didn't have to do it, God, but you chose to do it. Thank you so much for that gift. May these words not only convict us, encourage us, but just help us see how much you loved us to give us that special gift. In Jesus' name I pray. In continuing uh, Pastor Michael's summer with Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, we're going to look back at Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Now, this is Jesus' most famous teaching, and we find it in Matthew chapters 5 and 7. Here we see uh, are the characteristics of who King Jesus brings into his kingdom. And it also ends with a very harsh warning. So if you do have your Bibles and your note sheets and you want to turn, I'm going to start with actually the warning in chapter 7, and I'm going to read in verse 21. I'm starting this thinking back to a statement that was made to me after one of my messages here a few years ago. Two people that I knew fairly well who don't go to church here, 
were very complimentary to me of the message. But they also added this statement. They said to me, I never knew you were like that. Yeah, that was, uh, I was very great, or complimentary, excuse me, grateful for their kind words and their compliments. But I was also left in a very self-examination place, examinating place. Do they really not know that I am a follower of Jesus? I was thinking. So Jesus speaks to this in this warning in chapter 7. So I'm going to read verses 21 and 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many of you will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So I don't know about you, but that is a deadly warning to me. We have here in this story people who publicly and with emphasis said, Lord, Lord. They actually cried it out twice. They do great works. They're like Bible heroes compared to most of us. And then they're told by Jesus, sorry, you are evildoers and you're not in my book. He continues to call such people fools, saying, you're like a builder putting up a house with a sand foundation, and your fall was great when the storm came. So what is Jesus actually saying here? Is he saying that a person can declare Jesus as their Lord, but that may be insincere? I think, yes, he is saying that. For he also used the words in that verse, verse 23, I never knew you. Now, important, please keep in mind that this is Jesus' teaching, and he is, of course, serious. But also, very important, the Bible is perfectly clear. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus. The book of Romans says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, if this still causes some self-examination after hearing that story from Jesus. Please talk to God. Please talk to Pastor Michael. I volunteered earlier, Pastor Tom. Uh, talk to Kay. Talk to anyone who is a Bible-teaching individual. The self-examination is okay. Of course, this leads to the question, well, how do you know? It's a whole group of sermons on its own, but simply stated, after you declare Jesus is Lord, are you becoming different? I also have to state that I start this message with this warning with a confession of mine. See, I was saved by Jesus through recovery from addiction. And for a period of my life, many years ago, Jesus was correct in this warning because I know that for a fact it described me. I now have confidence in my examination today because some of me is different since declaring Christ. And one part of me is completely changed because of Christ. Also, I'm very fortunate my deck is still standing. I know how to build a foundation. Laura doesn't have to lay down and get out of her car and lay on her back to get the mail out of the mailbox. That's still standing. So I'm appreciative for Jesus for that part of the teaching. This warning, though, is also used to point us back to the beginning of Jesus' sermon on chapter, me, in chapter 5. This is where he tells us how we should be different. Here, Jesus talks about things like love your enemies, be salt and light, forgiveness, prayer, what is murder, what is adultery, worrying, judging, and many other virtues. And Jesus offers us, though, so much more. In the beginning of chapter 5, in verses 3 through 12, Jesus speaks of those who are the heart of Christ, and that those are the ones who receive the kingdom of heaven. So I'm going to read in chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, if you'd like to uh, turn to that. While you're doing so, ponder this question. If you had a choice, would you rather be poor, sad, weak, hungry, and hated? Or would you rather be rich, happy, 
strong, well-fed, popular. As you think about those, be honest with yourself. Don't give our teacher Jesus the answer that he wants to hear. So here we'll look at chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Blessed are the poor, excuse me, in verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. As I read these, I think about myself on Tuesday nights. See, I help lead a group that leads a group called Celebrate Recovery. And this is a Christ-centered 12-step group where we confess that Jesus is our Lord and Savior and our higher power. And we use his strength for healing from addictions, but also from any type of hurt, bad habit, hang-up that we all struggle with. Here we study these Beatitudes endlessly, over and over. And as you read them, aren't they peaceful sounding? Yet they're also very confusing, and they're hard to be in our real life. So in looking at these, we first need to look back at a little bit of history and context about these Beatitudes. Who is Jesus talking to, first of all? Jesus is just coming into his public ministry. He has just recently been baptized by John the Baptist. He went through 40 days of temptation in the wilderness. And he's now starting to preach and heal and do miracles. Right before this, in chapter 4... He starts to go for walks around the villages and the lakes of Galilee. In verse 19 of chapter 4, he calls two fishermen, Peter and Andrew, and they follow him. In verses 21 to 22, he calls two more fishermen, James and John, and they're fishing with their dad. They drop their nets, and those two follow him. Then he also goes on to say in verses 23 and 25 of that chapter, we have hundreds, if not thousands, of the lowest class, the sick, the poor, the unimportant, insignificant zeros of that day, they now follow him. These aren't the leaders of Jewish culture and religion. They're not the teachers of the ancient laws that state being the only path to God is following those laws. At that time, this was a culture that says the religious elite, the successful, the healthy, and the rich were blessed by God. The wise, the important, the winners were blessed by God. And the type of person now following Jesus, those were cursed by God. They were also important to know a conquered people. They're under Roman military occupation. They're left paying heavy taxes. And they're yearning for a military hero. So it's this setting that Jesus first says the words... Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then those next nine blessings. Jesus actually confirms their lowly state. But then he tells them that with Jesus as their monarch, theirs is the kingdom. There's an incredible illustration of this. I don't know if any of you are uh, users or partake in the Bible project, but one of the founders of that, he has this uh, part in teaching that he calls trash art. I'm sure you've probably never ever heard of trash art. Take a look at this. You see on a table, bottles, cans, it's a little fuzzy, but if you look closely, they're all shot up with bullet holes, all pierced. just looks like cans and bottles of junk. Look at the next light. 
or excuse me, the next screen. The gallery goes dark. A spotlight is shown in the perfect angle, and you now see that beautiful silhouette behind it. Here's another one. Literally a table full of trash. Your own commentary on that. Okay, same thing, the gallery goes dark. The perfect light is shown in the perfect moment. And this is not what you see. You can actually see people, the silhouettes of their faces, at peace, living in the trash. Kind of neat, isn't it, just seeing this? But the Bible Project founder, he illustrates this and he says, this is an example of the total reversal of perception that happened on that mountain with Jesus in the Beatitudes. With Christ's light perfectly shown, the worthless instantly become a vehicle for beauty and meaning in life. So what else is Jesus really doing here in the Beatitudes on that mountain? He's setting forth a new standard of living, not based on externals but based on a new way of thinking that re would result in a new way of living. He says it is a selfless standard. And the only people who can know this blessedness are the ones who know they can't live that way on their own. And they're totally dependent on Jesus Christ. There are a few more critical points that we need to know about the Beatitudes. First off, they are not how we become saved. They are characteristics of those with Jesus. They're signs of how we are different. Martin Luther says this. He says, Christ is saying nothing else here about how we become a Christian, but only about the works and fruit that no one can do unless he is a Christian and under the state of grace. It's also important to know that they have opposites. In the Bible, we see this word, woe. In the Gospel of Luke, Luke also talks about and describes these Beatitudes. And when he says them, they're in a little bit different format. For every one of the blessed virtues, he also says, woe. There's a curse that follows the opposite of the blessing. And you also see uh, throughout the Gospels, Jesus repeatedly is saying, woe to your Pharisees in many situations. Also, a very encouraging and wonderful gift to know is that these are not just wishes. One commentator calls them judicial pronunciations. They are tried and true promises from God. They're also the most genius sequence to Christ-centered healing available to any one of us for any struggle. Think about that sequence. The first thing he says is you're spiritually poor. And what are you doing? You're really you're admitting your denial. The second thing that happens is you mourn over being a sinner. That then allows you to become meek because you gain strength and humility with Christ. After that, you decide that you want to become righteous and pure. You want to change your ways and your character defects. That allows you then to become a peacemaker. You're able to offer forgiveness to those who have hurt you, and you make amends for how you've hurt other people. And then after you've done all that, you might be persecuted. And why is that? Because after you've done all these things and become this new person in Christ, you're bit by bit different. You start to irritate all those around you because you make them uncomfortable because you're different. It's also important to know that this wasn't just for the early followers of Jesus. Listen to one of my favorite recovery teachers, Pastor George. He describes us this way in relation to the Beatitudes. Who cares to admit complete defeat? Practically no one. Every natural instinct cries out against the idea of personal powerlessness. It can be truly awful to admit for us that only an act of providence can save and change us. Nobody wants to be a loser. And we learn this from our culture. We admire people who are physically strong, appearing beautiful, relationally well, financially stable, educationally accomplished, vocationally successful, emotionally fit, and spiritually healthy. But it's also not just our external world which shows this. We each have an inner part of us that is dark and insidious. 
There is this principle that screams inside. You can do it. You're in control. Don't ever give up. Now, sometimes in life, this isn't bad, Pastor George says. He relates how he was once on an operating table and he did not want the surgeon to ever give up. But we will all agree that pride is so much more pervasive in us than humility. This is in page one of our Celebrate Recovery program. And this is also the first point in your notes. I'm actually going to have all of us read this together. It allows us to really have that word I with it. Realize I'm not God. I admit that I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. This statement is so against our very nature, isn't it? Yet it needs to be admitted by us all and is a sign of spiritual poverty that Jesus was talking about. Now, each one of these blessings in its own is a separate message. It could be its own sermon. So I'm only going to define the first beatitude. And then I'm going to close up with an illustration. The very first thing Jesus said there, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What is he saying here? It's the first thing that someone must be to enter God's kingdom. Which also keep in mind is here. It's not just back in Jesus' day. It's not future in heaven. It is here, available to each one of us. No one ever entered by pride in who they are or what they do. Remember that warning we read in the beginning in chapter 7? Uh, the commentator uh, John MacArthur says this, Until we are poor in spirit, Christ is never precious enough to, to us because we only look at ourselves. We can't see Jesus. Until we see our own needs and desperation, we can never see the wonder of Christ. Until we understand how damned and how doomed we are, we can't see how glorious his mercy is. The specific words in that beatitude, the first one there is blessed, comes from a couple different places. The Greek word is makarios. The Latin word is actually beatitude. That's where that comes from. Some of your Bibles say blessed. Some of your Bibles actually say the word happy. It's God's favor. It's God is for you. You are right with God. It's a deep sense of bliss that the world can't offer. The world can't change. And the world can't take away from you. It's an internal peace in both good and bad. It's a desire for Christ that brings a sense of joy that ebbs and flows, but it never disappears. The next word Jesus says there is poor. Now, there's a number of things we need to look at with the word poor. First off, he isn't talking about money. If this were the case, we would have to turn around and give everything away and become destitute, and then we'd be welcomed into the kingdom. That is not what he's saying. If we did that, we'd actually have to eliminate charity, giving to the poor, missions, orphanages, maybe hospitals. But actually, if you think about it, we couldn't give things away because the recipients, they would then no longer be poor and destitute. We'd have to destroy every possession that we have. That's silly, isn't it? That's not what Jesus is talking about. So here's the fact that financially poor aren't automatically in the kingdom, and the rich are not automatically out of the kingdom. Jesus says it is the heart. Although it's important to think about this, financial or relational or educational poverty can be a very big head start. Poor people are generally closer to a spirit of being helpless. Rich people are generally closer to crediting their own self-sufficiencies, and that can easily spread to all areas of their life. Some people can't handle it, although some can, and the Bible is full of individuals who could. Now, yes, Greg, where does that come from? Well, Jesus tells this story about a rich young ruler. He's teaching with his apostles and disciples and followers, and a rich young ruler comes up and says, Teacher, what must I do to be saved? Jesus says, Follow commandment A, follow commandment B, follow commandment 3, follow commandment 4. And the rich young ruler says, well, I've done all those. Jesus says, okay, good. Now sell all your possessions, give them to the poor, and come and follow me. And what does the rich young ruler do? 
turns around, head down, walks away. I can picture his disciples saying, Jesus, what are you doing? This would have been a great prospect to help us. Rich young ruler, well-known, influential. We get him to come into our kingdom. He could have helped us out. What are you doing that for, Jesus? Well, how does Jesus respond? He says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. How many have tried to put that thread through that needle? I need these now desperately to do it. But try to put a camel through that hole. Jesus is saying it's not your bank account, but it's how self-sufficient you are which determines who enters the kingdom. I've been thinking about Pastor Michael. He made a point about this last week in the story about the rich young ruler. He said this, maybe it wasn't that the rich young ruler didn't sell everything, but maybe that he simply didn't follow Jesus. So I've been thinking about that, and I've imagined, what if that rich young ruler instead would have confessed? He would have said, this is impossible for me to do, Jesus. I can't meet these standards, and I can't do it. But then if he would have bowed down before Jesus in total repentance... Would it have turned out differently? What would Jesus have done? Jesus does not ever expect perfection with these beatitudes. He only expects us to be them bit by bit, to have desire and change. John writes this, If we think we are without sin, we deceive ourselves, and we call God a liar. A couple more things about poor, very important to understand. There's two types of poor used most often in the New Testament. The first one, which Jesus is not talking about here, is called penas or penes. It means you're poor and you have to work for your daily needs. You're a day laborer of sort. But you do have your own capabilities. The kind of poor that Jesus is talking about is from a word called tokas. What tokas means is someone who is reduced to a beggar. This was the person in that day who was a cowering beggar, all covered up, crying out from a dark corner for every need. No skills, no resources, often crippled, blind, a leper, deaf, dumb, mute, totally dependent on gifts just to live. And remember also, beggars never stop begging, do they? And now here's Jesus saying that this is the number one key to happiness. Crazy, isn't it? It leads to the question, think about yourself today, and I think about myself today. Am I penas? Am I in charge? Capable? Think I'm doing enough? Or are we tokas? Where does every task, every struggle, every thought of our eternity start with the thought that says, Jesus, I can't do it. The next word in that beatitude is spirit. I looked this up in my concordance. It says, the sentient element in man that by which he perceives, reflects, feels, desires. Now that was deep, I read. Okay, what it really means is your inner self. Some say it's your heart. It's begging on the inside, not on the outside. And know this, it doesn't mean someone who lacks enthusiasm or who is lazy or passive or indifferent to life and spiritual matters. It's a humble heart with strength from the outside through Jesus. And the last phrase in the Beatitudes, says the kingdom of heaven. And this one's easy. This is simply the peace and the bliss we talked about with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, Paul talks about one in the Spirit, the kingdom of heaven, enjoys the fruits. You live a life of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all things that we want to experience and be. In his kingdom, Jesus tells us over and over things like this. Losers become winners. The last shall be first. Those who die become alive. Those who get sick get well. And I add, the addict recovers. This leads to the final thought, the last part of the paradox of the Beatitudes. Jesus never intends to park us in that one thought, in that moment. 
The Bible is too full of examples to describe them all. Moses, Gideon, David, Isaiah, they were all first broken, then blessed, and then they were used by God. One I want to highlight, there's a character in the Old Testament named Jacob. You very well know him from the line of Abraham, Isaac, then Jacob. The name Jacob actually means trickster. See, Jacob was a liar. He was a cheat. He was a manipulator. There's a nickname for his name that's called heel grabber. Jacob was actually the second born of twins. So he came out seconds or minutes later. He was always grabbing for the heel of his older brother. And in fact, he actually cheated his older brother out of the family birthright. So one night when Jesus was on the run, he was by himself in the dark by a river. And in the darkness, a man came and he and Jacob wrestled all night. I cannot imagine the exhaustion of wrestling all night. This man, we learn, is actually an angel representing God. And when this man saw that he wasn't going to get Jacob to give in, he wrenches, throws Jacob on the ground and wrenches his hip out of his socket. I can't imagine that pain. And then he asked Jacob, who are you? What is your name? Now, he didn't want Jacob just to simply say, hey, I'm Jacob. He wanted Jacob, to, for the first time, to actually look at himself and admit who he was, a liar, a trickster, a manipulator, a cheat. And I believe Jacob did that. Because then what happened in the very next verse, Genesis 32, uh, verse 29, God blessed him the very next moment. If we look at the New Testament, Jesus' right-hand man, Peter, he cried out, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinner. Paul, the evangelist to the world, wrote half the New Testament, explained all of Jesus' teachings. He was as godly as could be. He wrote the greatest description of our nature that I have ever heard. It's in Romans chapter 7 and 8. Read that. I don't have time to go through the whole thing. But this is where he says those things like, I do what I don't want to do, and I don't do what I want to do. And at the end of this explanation, he says this phrase. This was his nature, the most godly man. He says, Oh, what a wretch I am. Who will save me? I also believe this is truth because I think it would be true in our lives if roles were changed. Imagine this. Imagine you who are parents. You go to bed at night. All of a sudden, the door bursts open and in runs your child. He or she is hysterical, screaming, crying out to you, begging for your help. Their whole day, they're beating up little Johnny. They're stealing Susie's candy, whatever they're doing wrong. And they're crying out, I can't stop. I can't stop. Help me. I don't want to be this, but I can't do anything about it. And they're crying and mourning. What would you do as a parent, knowing that we are such flawed parents compared to God? You would love them. You would bestow kindness. You would hug them. You would do everything you could to bring peace to their heart. You wouldn't care if they're an axe murderer. If you had the power of God, you would try to bring them into a whole new kingdom. Now, our human nature that despises powerlessness that we talked about is always going to rebel at this idea. But your poverty in spirit is your beginning, and it may be the hardest thing that you actually do every day of your life. I'm going to close up here with a story of two women. Elle, if you want to go ahead and play that video. And so that's when the heavy, heavy cocaine abuse came in, and I just wanted to disappear. I remember just lighting that pipe and just looking forward to that hit. All of a sudden, I heard my ears just ringing really loud, and, like, everything went black. Like, my eyes just shut down. My eyes were wide open, but it went black, and I fell back. And, um... I was having a heart attack. The pain in my chest was like, my heart was going and it was like, I felt like somebody was stabbing me with a knife in my heart, but I couldn't see anything. And all I could remember was that, it, it, you know, there was nothing but blackness around me. And just, I realized, crap, I'm dying. I'm dying. And all I could remember is Jesus. That's all I could think about was God. And I saw my life literally flash before my eyes. And as I called upon his name, I just said, Jesus, Jesus, 
I'm, I'm alone. I'm sorry. And come and get me. Save me from myself. I'm sorry. And all I could do was like say sorry. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was a prostitute. I was so ashamed. And the ambulance came. They took me in the hospital. And the doctor came over and said, um, do you know how lucky you are? You have a lot of drugs in your system, lady. And you're allergic to narcotics. And he's like, God's with you. And I knew, I knew that um, Jesus heard my prayer. I was in such despair and desperation. I would really cry out to God, you know. And then one night, he appeared to me in a dream. I would go into this beautiful garden and sat on the bench was the Lord Jesus. And I would go to him, we would sit, and we would just talk about, I don't even know what I spoke about, but he never, ever once condemned me. I said, Jesus, I just want to see you. I want to know what you look like. I don't care about the movies I've seen. I just want to see you. I want to talk to you, I want to see you. And so he granted my request. I had a dream of him one night. And he came to me, and he didn't look anything like any picture, any person I've ever seen before. He was the most handsome man I've ever seen. Beautiful. And he came to me and went this close to my face and looked into my eyes and read me from my baby until my perfect age that I was. Everything I've done didn't say a word to me and looked at me with love in his eyes like, I love you. It was such beauty and such love that emanated from him. I was just... Right, I fell at his feet. I, I was like a dead person. And believe me, at that particular point in my life, I wasn't scared of much, but I, I was... And it wasn't like a fear he's going to hit me. It was like who he was, who he really is. And I fell at his feet, and I just was... I just cried, and I said, Lord, I'm so sorry for what I've done. And when I got up, he'd say, Helena, I'm waiting for you. And... Uh, so beautiful, so, so gentle, so, so gentle. And that went on for about six months. I, 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 I was always waiting for him to say a harsh word or condemn me, but he didn't. He said, I love you. You're healed, you're whole, you're delivered. And just like this fire was lit in me. And I just started to weep. And I just realized, God loves me. No matter what I've done, no matter all the mistakes I've made, no matter how many people I've hurt, he still loves me. And he can make something of my life. Save me for myself, one of them said. I just want to see your face. You can... I think you can feel both the brokenness and the gift of the peace at the same moment there. Like these women, I finally understood just a glimpse of being spiritually poor one time. This was many years ago. It was one night. It was under a Christmas tree, as silly as it sounds. I was broken. I was alone with God. It was the first time that I ever actually admitted total powerlessness at one point. There were tears and uh, our crazy puppy. She was just months old and she was a crazy lab. But that entire night, she never moved from my shoulder. Now, you may not be an addict or you may not have hit a bottom with a life of drama like I talked about or like these women. That is not required for spiritual poverty. But do you simply have a heart of helplessness and desperation for Christ? Do you lie down at night and go to God with nothing to offer him except your sin and then ask for mercy? Remember our friend, the little mouse? I close with this. We left him having buried the snake in wood chips. Well, the snake woke up and started to move forward from the chips. The mouse knew he was going to be devoured if he didn't find a new way to save himself. He tried to dig his way out, but only found a layer of wood chips and then the glass bottom. He tried to run around the cage, 
but there was no escape. He tried to flex his muscles like little mighty mouse, but the snake kept coming closer. He tried to climb out, but with every step, he slid back down. Finally, he gave up, just sat in the corner, and looked up with total helplessness and despair in his eyes. Inside, he was thinking, there's nothing I can do. I'm just a mouse. And just as the snake was about to strike, the owner reached in with mercy and delivered the house, or excuse me, the mouse to a new home. The last point in your notes says this. Is your most basic thought, I need Jesus simply because I exist? We'll close and pray with that. Dear God, thank you so much for what Jesus gave us on that mountain. Every one of us so doesn't want to admit is this spirit of powerlessness, of helplessness. It's so against our nature. But God, no matter what we do, no matter how many times we run away from you, you are just dying to give each one of us your kingdom, your peace, your healing. Your Bible says we can ask, God, so I boldly ask for myself and each and every one of us. Grow that sense of spiritual poverty. Help us admit how desperate we are, how much we need you, how much we are helpless without Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. Next week continues a neat speaker on missions. Go in peace.